So hello everybody again and welcome to today's CEFES JRC webinar. My name is Claudio Morana and I'm the director of CEFES, the Center for European Studies of the University of Milano Bicocca. CEFES Dems gathers scholars from different fields in economics, political science and law to contribute to the empirical and theoretical debate on the European economy. We have several events planned over the next few months. Please let me recall the Rethinking Capitalism webinar series jointly organized with RCA Europe, ETS, which will run through April. A workshop on migration and refugee crisis in late March, and the fourth conference on European studies on June 2022. Please join us in these events and submit your paper to our incoming conference in uh, uh, through uh, Conference Maker. And please visit our website for further information on all our activities. Today's webinar is part of a joint CFSGRC scientific initiative. We are proud to carry on this initiative to connect scholars worldwide and strengthen their cooperation, particularly in this period of high human, social, economic, and political distress. Before introducing our speaker, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Lucia Alessi of the Joint Research Center of the European Commission for her welcome remarks. Thank you, Claudio, and uh, a warm welcome from my side too to this first webinar uh, of this year. Uh, here I'm representing the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, which is, uh, as you know, the uh, science and knowledge arm of the European Commission. Uh, given the topic of today's uh, uh, seminar on, on global flows, it might be uh, worth mentioning that at the JRC we have uh, several activities that are somehow related. Uh, for example, we uh, build the, 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 the so-called FinFlows data set, um, which includes data on cross-border financial flows and stocks of foreign direct, direct investment on portfolios and other financial investments for around 100 countries worldwide. Uh, and we use these data to calculate uh, indicators of financial integration for uh, UK, UK countries. And we also do FD, so called FDI screening, um, meaning we screen uh, foreign investments in the EU and we work on foreign, um, uh, on foreign direct investment and on global value chains, uh, and in particular on, for example, on semiconductor. Um, now, I would like to say that I am particularly happy to have Livio today with us, uh, as I, I have worked at the European Central Bank myself for many years. I have the pleasure to know uh, Livio personally, and I also uh, can also witness his uh, uh, excellent work, not only as a scientist, but also as a senior manager. And, and I can tell you, based on my own experience, being both uh, is, uh, is quite hard. So I don't know how he manages. Uh, Livio, uh, very welcome also from my side, and, and the, the, I leave the floor to, to the same. So, ah, is Andrea now? Yeah. You're muted, Andrea. You're muted. It's a, it's a pleasure to have Livio today. And uh, uh, Livio is the Deputy Director General of International and the European Relations at the at ECB. And he's also an adjunct professional at the University of Frankfurt. And uh, his main research interests are in international economics and monetary economics. And today he will be talking about a paper titled The Asymmetry and Adjustment of Global Imbalances, Myth or Fact. And uh, Livio, you have about 40 minutes for your presentation. We take question and answer in the Q&A session of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, the uh, the platform and uh, we will discuss them at the end of the presentation so please write, please write your questions in the in the q a session and uh, you will be you will have the chance to ask to talk to Livio at the end of this presentation so please leave your now the floor is yours uh, so first of all, uh, thanks, Andrea. First of all, thank you for 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 the introduction for the invite to this uh, very interesting seminar series, which actually I have also attended for for other presentations already uh, and uh, it's also nice to reconnect with uh, Claudia and Lucia both of whom are, are you know uh, former colleagues and also people I know and I have uh, in, in high regard so now I, I share my screen okay now I'm hoping that you will soon see uh, the slides 
on your screens. Yes, we see them. Okay, super. Okay, so this is a uh, is is a rather preliminary work uh, together with Neos Dosa, who is a uh, now um, a graduate student uh, at the European University Institute, um, but uh, this work was mostly done when she was uh, um, also a trainee uh, in the uh, European Central Bank. Uh, and uh, it's a paper about the, the kind of uh, old uh, historical uh, question of whether uh, the adjustment of current account imbalances asymmetrics, namely it is harder or it is more compelling to, to, to adjust um, deficits than uh, surpluses, but I, I, I'll go into more uh, detail uh, in a second. Um, and I should also mention the disclaimer that these views are, are personal, don't, uh, don't obviously imply DCP or any other institution. So this, uh, this issue of the uh, asymmetric adjustment of current account imbalances uh, uh, has been dubbed in the past the secular international problem. Uh, and um, so so this uh, this this discussion really started uh, in the in the 40s, uh, you know, with a new um, order uh, following the Bretton Woods Conference, uh, and after a period, uh, which was the gold standard prevailing before before the interwar period, uh, where um, it, it was thought that current account adjustments were essentially symmetric. So the the the, the amount of gold and the and the price of gold would would clear. Uh, current account imbalances. Uh, this was also a period when capital flows were also limited. Um, but now, with the collapse of the gold standard, it was not clear already at the time uh, whether uh, any monetary international monetary system would um, uh, always and easily correct um, current account uh, imbalances or balance of payment imbalances. And so already in, in 1941, John Minor Keynes uh, had uh, work on a plan uh, called the Cleaning Union Plan, which may aimed at making the adjustment compulsory for both uh, creditors and debtors. Um, so it, it was already the view that, uh, that in the absence of a gold standard, uh, the adjustment would be compulsory for the debtor and voluntary for the creditor. In, in, so in other words, the, the, the debtor had to act uh, and to correct the, the, the deficit, but the, the, the surplus uh, would not have to do anything. Um, so so uh, in, the, in the 1941 Clinic Union plan, uh, one, um, um, one, one key feature was that, uh, that creditors could not uh, charge high interest rates uh, for lent to debtors. Uh, and then there would be an, uh, an international clearing bank uh, that, um, would basically correct uh, uh, all uh, imbalance, including surplus imbalances. Um, so, uh, as, as as we will um, see in a second, uh, things didn't go his way uh, during the Bretton Woods Conference. Uh, but since then, the the this question of symmetry adjustment has resurfaced um, uh, in in uh, international forum, international meetings. So, I am myself witnessed in my um, policy experience, uh, which um, uh, Lucia was, was referring to before. Uh, uh, I've written several times in which um, uh, representatives of creditors and debtors have argued um, uh, in favor or against the idea that uh, the adjustment is asymmetric. And typically, the, the, the deficit uh, countries always argue that they have to do all the work uh, uh, in the adjustment. So at least at, at the level of perception, uh, of policymakers, this this asymmetry is is well uh, entrenched. So the the existence of these asymmetries is well entrenched. Uh, okay, so during the the Bretton Woods Conference, and um, as many of you maybe uh, already know, there was a a very good account uh, of that uh, in the book by Ben Style, uh, the Battle of Bretton Woods. Um, I mean, it, it, the book, by the way, is full of uh, historical. Um, uh, interesting facts, including the fact that Harry Dexter White, who is the man uh, on the left side, uh, the, the um, American host of the conference, uh, was also a kind of Soviet spy uh, and also died uh, before being prosecuted. Uh, and the man on the right is John Minor Keynes, obviously. And so the, these, these two were representing the two major powers at the time, the, the US and the UK. Uh, and and uh, the, uh, as probably uh, you, uh, as you probably already know, the the UK at the time was a was a big debtor country, and the US was a creditor 
So you know, in the case of the US, very different from what is the situation now. Um, and so the, the, uh, because the US had the upper hand uh, uh, economically and in other, uh, politically in other ways, uh, in the end, uh, uh, Keynes' um, clean union plan was uh, sidelined uh, and, uh, and the Bretto Woods order, including the IMF and so on, was created. Uh, and, and many argue that in the wake of the Bretton Woods conference and in the new order created by it, uh, uh, a permanent, a permanent feature of the of the international monetary system is that uh, deficit countries need to do something, need to act. Uh, they have a problem, uh, but surplus countries uh, don't. Surplus countries don't need to do anything. So this uh, this is uh, has been the common perception since then. Uh, so it's a question that continues to divide. Uh, as, as I mentioned, continues to be discussed in, in policy circles. Uh, you know, for example, you know, in, a, in an example closer to, to us in Europe, uh, we know, for example, that the EU macroeconomic imbalance procedure, uh, so it is a mechanism which tries to correct excessive imbalances in the EU um, as, a, as a scoreboard uh, of monitoring thresholds. So these are uh, thresholds beyond which uh, countries are monitored more closely. Uh, and these, these thresholds are asymmetric for, for surplus and deficit. So if you are um, a country uh, uh, with a deficit, uh, you, you get this additional monitoring as soon as you surpass 4% of GDP. But if you are a surplus country, this threshold is 6% of GDP. So already there, um, there is this, uh, this asymmetry. Um, and, and by the way, the, the, the macroeconomic imbalance procedure is currently under review, so it is discussed right now in, uh, in the European fora. But another, another interesting discussion also took place in the G20, and this was, uh, I think, about a decade ago. So there was also there the idea to have uh, some kind of monitoring thresholds. If you have excessive uh, current account imbalances, uh, you will be uh, subject to more yeah, monitoring, uh, and at the time, of of course, there was this, uh, this issue of uh, US uh, deficit versus Chinese surplus. Uh, so as you can easily imagine, this, this, uh, this discussion went nowhere. So these norms were actually never really introduced. Um, but also there, um, this discussion of the asymmetry was also, was also important. Uh, but even despite of all this uh, story and so on, uh, there isn't much really formal research on this question. Uh, and so this paper is it, it is really what we 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 try to to do, at least to have a first pass uh, at this question with a, in in a more rigorous way. Uh, so the first question we have to ask ourselves is what do we mean by asymmetric adjustment of current accounts? Uh, so obviously arithmetically, surpluses and deficits need to match. Uh, so we know that in practice is not the case uh, because of these. Um, part called errors and omissions, which doesn't add up globally. So we know that the, the world has a, has a current account uh, surplus, I believe. Um, but this is more like a problem, is a data problem, is a reporting uh, data and a problem. But the, the, the conceptually, at least, you know, in a kind of statistical concepts, uh, deficit and surplus should match. Uh, and so, so current accounts are in sense, essentially relative positions. So you can't really say, you know, that country is, uh, so the deficit is adjusted, but the surplus not, because when, whenever the, sur the, the deficit adjusts, also the surplus adjusts, is a relative variable. Um, so, so here, uh, so what we, 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 we say here is that uh, you, you could envision a situation where the asymmetry is in the degree of policy activism. So what is the null hypothesis uh, or the hypothesis we want to test is whether is, is that countries, deficit countries need to tighten policy and then we can discuss exactly which policy, but, but basically deficit countries need to do something uh, while the surplus countries don't need to change anything in their policies. So you can, have, you can think of an adjustment where all the policy action is on the side of deficit countries. Um, but which would then result in an adjustment of relative um, deficit and surplus positions, which then implies also shrinking of surplus positions. So the the so in the sense you don't see the you don't see the evidence in the in the in the raw uh, uh, deficit and surplus positions, but you see the difference in 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 terms of how policy 
uh, uh, deviates from, from, from the level you would observe uh, uh, in the absence of these external imbalances. So you, you would observe a deviation only in deficit countries, or you don't observe a deviation in, in surplus countries. So the, at least this is the hypothesis that this asymmetry implies. Uh, so, so our, our paper tries to 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 give a bit of a, a also theory and and empirical evidence uh, around around that. So, before I go into uh, the details of what we do, uh, I think it's useful that I give a bit of punchline or or uh, the key findings. So, first of all, we have a, we have a kind of a small uh, um, simple model analysis. Uh, and this, this model analysis gives a little bit of story, um, it formalizes the story um, that, that you know, all of us may have in mind in, in, in terms of why um, only deficit countries need to act and not, and not surplus countries. Uh, so, um, so, so we find uh, uh, in this simple model that, um, that deficit countries have you know, used fiscal policy to react more countercyclical to deficits, but, but surplus countries don't need to do that. Uh, and then in terms of facts, uh, what we do, we, we look at um, um, a number of current account adjustment episodes. So either deficits that get corrected or surpluses that get corrected. So, so we have a, a sample of, of um, adjustment episodes in, the, in, in um, advanced and emerging countries. And then we look at what happens in this, uh, around these episodes. So we look at how we variables are correlated uh, with, we, you know, how, how a bunch of variables behave around these adjustment episodes, distinguish it between surplus and deficits. And in general, we find no widespread evidence of, of, of asymmetries between surplus and deficit adjustments. So you don't, we don't see a lot of asymmetry. So the, 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 just the, 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 the raw data around the adjustments look relatively symmetric. Uh, one, one key find that we uh, identify, however, is that uh, in since that deficit adjustments are more correlated with import compression, so basically imports go down uh, and the export, exports remain unchanged, while the surplus adjustments are associated with export compression. So when, when, uh, when countries adjust surpluses, uh, exports uh, are reduced, but imports are unchanged. Okay, so, so if you, so this implies that a situation where both deficits and surplus are reduced, so global imbalances shrink, uh, would imply basically there are less imports and exports, and therefore this, uh, so it, it, it would basically be trade reducing. So it would be bad, bad for world trade. Um, and then the final part of the analysis is a, is a panel regression where we, we, we focus on fiscal policy because fiscal policy is, we believe, the key tool that at least you know, in, the, in the policy debate is associated with more or less policy action is in relation to, to, to current account imbalances. And in, in, in terms of reduced forms, we, we, if you just regress fiscal policy on current account position, on, on, on lagged current account positions, you don't find any uh, clear evidence of, of a reduced form relationship. But when, you, when we um, uh, consider uh, exogenous shocks to the current account, which are essentially transfer trade shocks, and we discuss later in concrete what they mean, uh, there is some evidence of asymmetry. So we do find that fiscal policy is indeed countercyclical only for deficits. So, so in terms of, so even though in terms of reduced form, we don't see this, this asymmetry, if you condition on, on a, a well-identified shocks, uh, uh, then uh, this, this asymmetry uh, kind of resurfaces. Uh, so I should mention this is work in progress, so any, any comments welcome, because it's still, uh, it's a very, we still have to, to submit anywhere. So um, let me go quickly through the previous literature. So there, there's been a, a, a literature on, on current account um, adjustments. Um, and um, I mean, it's, there, would, there would be older papers. I mean, several of them by uh, Sebastian Edwards on, um, on the role of sudden stops for current account reversals uh, and, and how basically, you know, one story which comes out uh, is that, uh, uh, often these reversals are associated with sudden stops. So, so you, it's not that countries really want to reduce the deficit, uh, but it's more they are forced to reduce the deficit by sudden stops. And you can think of the, or, or the euro area sovereign debt crisis also from that standpoint. Uh, so there, there was a basically a, a reversal of capital flows uh, and, and basically the adjustment of the balance of payments was forced by this uh, abrupt uh, capital outflow or net capital outflow. 
um, then there is a, um, a leisure, obviously, on the on the correction of stock imbalances. Uh, and so the, this, this also has become more important over time. So the, the attention has been shifting from, from flow imbalances to stock imbalances. Um, and so there, there, there have been papers on, on that. Uh, and one interesting paper is, is the one by uh, uh, Eric Alberola and, and co-authors, uh, where the basic imbalances are, are stabilizing or not. Uh, for in, in relation to the kata composition. And, and what they find is that um, the behavior of the stock imbalances uh, is, is stabilizing only for deficits, but not for surpluses. Um, and also they find that in surpluses, the trade balance moves in a perverse way. So they do find some, I mean, they, they, their question is different from ours, but just still they find some evidence of, of a symmetry in particular for stock imbalances. Uh, another question which has been also looked at recently is, is, is a question of returns on external portfolios, uh, so external asset liabilities. So um, some papers, for example, Adler and Garcia Masia, uh, they have found that um, uh, they have looked whether uh, the returns on net foreign assets is stabilizing or destabilizing uh, in terms of the uh, current account position. So if you are in a surplus country, uh, do you lose, uh, do, you, uh, do you get negative um, uh, returns uh, that, tend to, that, that tends to stabilize, stabilize the current account or, or the net uh, uh, financial asset position? I mean, there was a discussion, for example, in your year to Germany. So, um, so an, an argument was that you know, though Germany had a very persistent current account surplus, it was actually making negative returns on, on, a, on the external, uh, on the net and external assets which then were stabilizing in terms of the net financial asset position. So, so this, basically this paper generalizes this, this kind of intuition to, to, to a, to a uh, sample of countries. And, and it finds that, uh, yes, it's this, this seems to be stabil stabilizing for emerging economies, but it doesn't seem to be the case for reserve issues. So the, the, the U for the US, for example, uh, this doesn't, doesn't seem to hold. And then a, a final, uh, a paper, interesting paper that is also related to what we do is, is, the, is the one by Alessio Terzi, uh, who basically looks at current account adjustments um, uh, in the euro area vis-a-vis -vis other countries. So in particular, current account adjustments during the euro area crisis. Uh, and basically what he finds is that in terms of lost output, uh, the adjustment in the euro area were more costly than other current account adjustments. Uh, not only in, in other countries in general, but also re in relation to other countries who are in a peg arrangement, so have a fixed exchange rate. So, so basically, it, it focuses on the euro area vis-a-vis -vis other similar countries, and it finds that the adjustment euro area is more costly. So, so these are these are probably are, are the, the papers that are closer to what, what we do. So let me spend like maybe five minutes on the on the on the model, which is very simple. Uh, so. So think of a, a, a two country endowment economy, uh, so a home and a foreign economy, uh, is a simple infinite horizon economy with flexible prices. Uh, and, and suppose that the home consume, so think of this as, uh, you know, um, let, let's say uh, Greece and Germany, okay? So, um, so suppose that the, the Greek consumers are, are subject to a time preference shock. So they become more impatient. So they want to consume now. Um, and but if, if when the Greeks borrow from the Germans, uh, the uh, basically they had to pay an interest rate premium on uh, on their on their foreign debt, uh, and, and this is what creates the asymmetry. Uh, and uh, and the government controls the next the net government spending, and can also internalize the debt externality. So. Um, so in practice, the model was like this. Uh, so we have log utility over consumption. So um, the usual, usual uh, expected utility. The, 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 the time discount factor beta is subject to time preference shocks. Okay, so, so uh, a fall in this epsilon shock uh, indicates uh, more impatient consumers. Okay, so the consumers uh, want to consume today and not tomorrow. And in terms of the, uh, the budget constraint, you have this uh, 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 debt accumulation. That, so debt is B, capital B. Uh, you, you can think of this as foreign debt, okay? Uh, 
Uh, and then you have G, and G is, uh, is basically net government spending. So you can think of G as uh, a kind of a fiscal policy. Um, so so the, uh, think, of, think of the, the, the government as a constant discount factor. So the, gover the, the Greek government, so to speak, is, uh, is more patient than the Greek consumer. So the, um, the government as, as a fixed uh, constant discount factor. Uh, and finally, B and G, so, so the net foreign debt and fiscal policy are subject to adjustment costs. Uh, and we, we also impose that these adjustment costs are bigger for G. So fiscal policy as a, as a bigger adjustment cost. So you can think of this as a fiscal policy being kind of costly and, and long to, to change. Yeah, you need parliament approval, et cetera. Uh, so in, in, and then we, we assume that there is a debt elastic interest rate. So the, the interest rate is given by the inverse of the, um, this is a gross interest rate, the inverse of the discount factor. And then there is a, a term, uh, gamma B, uh, which is basically uh, the, um, the, the is, you can think of a risk premium. So the, the, the higher the debt, the, the higher the interest rate. And this is uh, a feature which several other models have is, there is nothing new in there. Uh, so in the decentralized solution, the consumer stakes are as given. Uh, so each, each Greek citizen doesn't care uh, about the existence of this risk premium. Uh, but in the domestic social planner solution, so the Greek government internalizes this constraint, constraint uh, and therefore sets fiscal policy to partly counter the time preference shock, okay? And then you can also think of a global social plan solution where uh, the Greek and the, and the German governments uh, 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 make a coalition uh, and they choose both G and G star. So G, G star is, is, uh, is fiscal policy in Germany simultaneously to maximize world welfare. Why do they want to do that? Because I mean, exactly because fiscal policy is possible to change. So, uh, so because the German government knows that in the future is gonna be Germany who has uh, the, the time preference shock, uh, it may be uh, more convenient to minimize the adjustment cost just to, um, you know, to, to stabilize, to stabilize uh, uh, expenditure and therefore debt uh, uh, together with the, Together with the Greek government, so you can think of this uh, loosely speaking as, as as a euro area fiscal policy kind of. Uh, so this is the these are the parameters for the for the calibration, which are not very interesting. So so this is what happens in the in the in this very simple model once you have a home uh, time preference shock in the decentralized solution. So where where uh, the citizen decide, so the the home consumer becomes more impatient, uh, as as I said. Uh, and therefore consumes more uh, by borrowing from the foreigners. So the, the, the Greeks borrow from the Germans that this creates a current account deficit. Uh, but uh, also uh, domestic citizens pay a premium on foreign debt, which, which they take as given. Uh, and the government actually partially compensates for this. So you have a, a tightening of fiscal policy, but not a, not a very big tightening, but you have a tightening of fiscal policy. So the Greek, uh, the Greek government, because we, remember, the Greek government is more patient than, than, the, um, than, than the consumers, uh, uh, tightens fiscal policy. Um, then uh, let's consider now the social planner solution where, where basically the, um, the Greek government internalizes the debt externality. So recognizes that, um, that this is a, yeah, that there is this, uh, the existence of the externality. So you can think of this as a, as a macroprudential role of fiscal policy. And is exactly the same logic of uh, imposing capital controls to correct over borrowing. So you have all these papers by Anton Korinek and, and coders on, on, on that, on, on, uh, on basically on the uh, optimality of imposing capital controls to correct over borrowing. And I mean, a, a similar logic is, is, uh, is a place here. So, so you, basically the, um, the um, uh, home fiscal policy makes an extra tightening, and you, you can see basically on the uh, in the uh, second to the right, the middle to the right um, uh, figure, uh, you see that so the red is a social planner solution, the blue is a decentralized solution. So you see that fiscal policy is, is tighter uh, in the in the um, social planner solution, and this only is importantly only happens for deficits. So you, you will not see um, the, same, the same reaction from the surplus from the other country, 
Okay, so it's only the deficit country that uh, needs to tighten fiscal policy more. Uh, and why does it do it? Again, in order to correct the externality associated with, uh, with the debt, uh, with the fact that debt is interest elastic. Uh, so it's exactly the same logic as you have uh, in all the papers on, on capital controls. Uh, so then, uh, so we still have to develop actually the global uh, social plan and solution. Uh, but I already mentioned that the idea is that uh, uh, using domestic fiscal policy to do this extra tightening is costly because of these adjustment costs. Uh, uh, there is scope for having a risk sharing arrangement between home and foreign fiscal authorities. So, but this is a, is a bit of an aside in this in the discussion. But no, but it's interesting to notice that that this simple model provides a rationale which is different from the usual rationale for, for making a kind of a centralized fiscal policy or at least an, a fiscal policy agreement between the, the two um, uh, economies. Uh, so let me, um, let me just uh, summarize then the, what, what the main implications of the model are. So the, uh, the government leans against the impatience of the private sector when the private sector becomes more impatient. I mean, becoming more impatient is a kind of a metaphor for demand shocks, for excessive demand. Okay, so, so you can think of this as when the demand, when there is a, you know, uh, expansion demand shock or, or, the, uh, or unsustainable, if you can think of this as unsustainable consumption boom uh, or the like, uh, then the government has to lean against. But importantly, it does more so, so it's more counter cyclical if, internal, if it analyzes the fact that external debt is costly. So this is a social planner solution. So what is a testable hypothesis coming out of this simple model is that the adjustment of deficits is accompanied by tighter fiscal policy than the adjustment of surpluses. Uh, and then I already mentioned the global solution, but I don't go there again. Okay, let me now turn to some evidence so after giving this kind of this uh, simple framework. Uh, so, so we look at basically uh, annual data um, sample 1980-2009, uh, uh, and we have um, a large sample of uh, advanced and emerging economies, so 70 countries. And uh, so what we do, so how do we identify counter count adjustment episodes? Of course, there is no single way to do it. Uh, so we have tried different ways. Uh, uh, and basically, we came up, came up with this, uh, which seems to be reasonable. It gives also a reasonable amount of adjustment episodes. So what is an adjustment episode for us is a six-year period in which the current account changes sign and moves by more than 5 percentage points cumulatively. So is a, is a, suppose that the country has a 5% uh, deficit and within six years it moves to a surplus, uh, this to us is a current account adjustment. Of course, you can argue about uh, the duration or the and, and there is no, 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 no right or wrong way to do it. Uh, so we have obviously tried other, uh, other criteria. Uh, in the end, it, it, it boils down to whether you have enough significant episodes or not, and, and whether the results also are robust to changing these, these definition episodes. So, so we have done that to some extent. Of course, I cannot say that, that, that our results generalize to all possible definitions of kind of adjustment episodes, but I think it's a, it's a reasonable starting point. Uh, and, and note that this, this is, is, is symmetric. So, so, you, uh, so a, a deficit adjustment is, is a movement from by more than 5 percentage points uh, from, from below zero to above zero. And the surplus adjustment is the opposite. It's a movement by more than 5 percentage points from above zero to below zero. Uh, so what we find if we um, um, apply exactly the same definition, we find that basically there, there is more um, there is more uh, deficit adjustment and, and less surplus adjustment. Um, so this is this has been noted already. So um, Edwards has a, has a paper on that. Uh, but but this could be a problem. So so what we do, we also we also have a robustness check where we also uh, increase the number of surpluses. So we relax the, the the assumption for surpluses, and we therefore capture more uh, surplus adjustments in the in the sample. Uh, so what happens during a typical deficit or surplus adjustment? So you see uh, this. Uh, I mean, it, it, this is uh, uh, the level and the first difference of the current account. You can focus on the on the one on the left. So the level. So in in a deficit adjustment, the blue line. So you go to below zero to above zero. So within within uh, five six years, 
uh, and the opposite happens uh, during the uh, surplus adjustments as you are you are uh, you know on average uh, around eight uh, percent uh, and then in, uh, you know within four years uh, it goes to around zero and then uh, it within five years it goes to levels uh, below zero okay so this is this is what really happened and this is I would say relatively symmetric so so maybe you can argue about minor differences but is is essentially symmetric uh, okay, then what we do is that we, we look at some covariates of the, of the adjustments so variables that are correlated with the, uh, or, or basically we look at how variables will behave uh, during the adjustment period. Okay, so we, we run a very simple regression. So Y is, um, um, is a variable of interest. Uh, think of this as export or imports. Um, and, and basically we, we regress this variable on country and time dummies. Uh, and then the dummy uh, capturing the adjustment. Okay, so you can think of, for example, if, if, if Y is imports, you can think of this as how imports deviate from a baseline uh, during those adjustment episodes. So in, in an adjustment of a deficit, for example, what imports do different from what they do normally, where normally is taken both in terms of the average for that country, but also in, in, you know, by controlling for time effects, you know, normally against global trends. So trends are common to all countries, okay? Um, and we do this for, for a bunch of variables. I don't have time to go through all of them now. Uh, so this is just an example of what happens uh, to, to interesting variables. So, uh, so on the left, we have the, the level of the trade balance. So you, you find, and probably predictably that, um, that the trade balance is, 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 is highly correlated with, with what uh, the, the, the current account adjustment does, because of course the trade balance is a very important component to the current account. So, uh, so you find that there is a marked improvement in the, in the trade imbalance, the trade deficit in, the, in, in deficit adjustments, and there is a marked market reduction in the, in the trade balance to GDP in surplus adjustments. And on the right, you, you see the, um, Valuation, uh, uh, devaluation component. So here, this uh, speaks more to the question of whether uh, devaluation is is uh, stabilizing or destabilizing. Uh, and so what we find, here, so devaluation is uh, is basically uh, is, is the net value of your foreign portfolio. Well, is, is the value of foreign portfolio uh, considering both assets and liabilities. No? So how how the value of your portfolio changes to, due to changes in in pricing and exchange rates. Uh, and, and this, uh, uh, we find that um, it actually, for a period at least, it moves against the, uh, the adjustment. Uh, so it namely becomes more positive for surplus and more negative for, for deficits. So in a sense, it's, uh, uh, it, it, seems, it seems to indicate that it, go, that it moves against uh, the adjustment. So it kind of uh, in a stabilizing fashion, so to speak. Um, so now, given that I don't have time to go through uh, all the uh, correlations that we, we look at in the paper, um, uh, let me give you a, a bit of uh, the key messages. So we find that the trade balance, as I showed you, is an important part of the average adjustment. Um, um, and we also find that net income, net income meaning in the meaning of the balance of payments, goes in the same direction of the adjustment. But the change in the net finance, financial position, valuation effects tend to go rather in the opposite direction. So you, you, you can think of this as in a, in a stabilizing function. Uh, so inflation goes up in deficit adjustments and down in surplus adjustments. Uh, I mean, not, not very statistically significantly. Uh, and to, quite to our surprise is uh, both exchange rates and interest rates don't move in a statistically significant way. So we don't find big differences between deficit and surplus adjustments. Uh, we find that the primary balance, which is our measure for, for fiscal policy, becomes tighter in surpluses and looser in deficit adjustments. So this is a little bit the opposite of what, of what you would expect. Uh, uh, but of course, it depends on what shock drives what. So, so, so from a reduced form, and, and I'll come to that in a minute, uh, you can't say, really say much. But, but certainly, this evidence is this kind of reduced form evidence doesn't really scream uh, that um, that the deficit countries need to run a counter fiscal fiscal policy. So quite the opposite; they actually loser. They have loser fiscal policy. Um, uh, there is no important difference for pegs because we also consider these correlations only for pegs. Uh, 
um, you know, distinguish impacts from floating rate, from floating countries, but doesn't seem to be big difference. Um, and also I remember that we had a, a robustness exercise where we had more surplus adjustments because in the baseline we have more, many more or significantly more deficit adjustment and surplus adjustments. So we have more. Uh, so when we uh, expand uh, the number of surplus adjustment episodes, again, very similar results, no major difference. Um, and on, in general, if you consider asymmetry, we find that on most dimensions, deficit and surplus adjustments are, are the mirror image of each other. So not big difference. However, as I already mentioned before, one important difference, deficit adjustments are accompanied by import compression, so uh, lower imports, surplus adjustments by export compression, so less exports. And this is an important difference. Okay, now in the last uh, maybe like five minutes, let me focus uh, on fiscal policy. So given that you know, fiscal is, 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 is probably in the common narrative, uh, an important part of this idea that, um, that in general, you need to have more policy activists uh, in, in reaction to deficits. Um, so we, we, we try to go beyond simple correlations. And um, I mean, we are also a bit inspired by our model where, where, where as, as explained, the shock uh, that leads to a current account deficit um, uh, should optimally elicit uh, a tighter fiscal policy. So, so we investigate this by running some panel OLS regressions uh, where our dependent variable is, uh, is the primary balance, which is a kind of a rough estimate, rough measure of, um, of fiscal policy. Uh, so here we have an endogeneity uh, problem clearly. Uh, so the uh, so so causality could run from the fiscal bill to the current account, and not only from the current account to fiscal. So you you can think of the 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 huge literature on the so-called twin deficits. Um, so but what, what is the direction of the bias? So so the the direction of the bias is towards finding a positive a more positive link between the primary balance and the current account. Okay, so a tighter stance of fiscal policy should lead to kind of account surplus. Um, so, so, this is, so, so the, 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 the reduced form relation between fiscal policy and the current account is likely to have a positive bias. Uh, if, you, if you think of the, uh, of the story that, um, uh, that, the, that the current account deficit drives uh, tighter fiscal policy, then what you would observe is a negative coefficient. So you would observe that, uh, that you have a higher primary balance in reaction to more negative current account levels. Okay. So this is, this is uh, and, and uh, it's not easy to disentangle all these channels. Um, so so we, 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 we give a go in this paper in the following way. So we, 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 we try to build uh, current account shocks or external shocks uh, that are, you know, can be thought also as, a, as, a, as terms of trade shocks. So, so the busy, you can think of it as an external instrument which is based on the interaction between uh, the change in the oil price. So we, we take the oil price is a global variable, so it's not influenced by any individual country. Uh, and then the, this, this one is, this, this, this variable is interrupted with the lagged oil trade balance, which is, a, you can think of it as the country sensitivity to the global shock. So, so for example, think of a situation where the, the, uh, the supply shock pushes the oil price higher uh, this uh, hits more oil importers than exporters, or, or, or if you are a more oil importer, I mean, most of the countries in our sample are actually oil importers, but if you import more oil, or if you had, if you used to import more oil before the shock, um, then, uh, uh, then basically you, you experience a larger current account deficit as a response to that, to that uh, shock. Okay, so you, it's a negative transfer shock for oil importers. So, so there's, there, there have been papers, uh, for example, Bodenstein, Ersen, and Guerrieri showing that um, the current account of oil importers need, needs to converge back to sustainable equilibrium. Uh, and so you have, you have, you have basically a, a shock to the current account and also the need of a correction in the current account, which is exactly what we have in mind in the, in the analysis of episodes. So, so we want to have a situation where where there is a current account and then uh, and then it's uh, is corrected over time. Um, so so the shock again is uh, is a combination of the change in the oil price uh, and the lag uh, country level oil trade balance. Uh, 
Uh, and then we can uh, uh, basically take a moving average of the shock uh, because it makes things more more kind of more persistent. So the question is, 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 is uh, we believe it's exogenous, but it's also relevant. And here in this regression, we show that uh, this shock is actually relevant. So it's, it's a relevant driver of the, of the current account. Uh, so, so this regression shows that uh, is, is statistically significantly associated with, uh, with the actual current account position. So this, this current account shock is important, is, is a driver. Not important, well, it's not exactly important, but certainly is a driver of current account positions. And so what we do uh, here is basically we, we regress, uh, we regress uh, the primary uh, balance, the governing primary balance on, uh, on a bunch of control variables on which I, I will not spend time, but it is the usual uh, GDP, inflation, et cetera. Uh, and then we, we regress on this exogenous current account shock that, we have, uh, that I just described. Uh, and we do this in, in a symmetric and asymmetric fashion. So, the symmetric is simply the, the simple regression. The asymmetric is, 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 is one where we distinguish positive and negative shocks, okay? Uh, and and this, is, this is what the regression shows. Now, here, I probably don't have time to go through the uh, individual coefficients. You have to trust me about my description of what we find, but basically, what are the key messages from these, from these regressions? Um, so we find, again, there is no clear reduced form relationship between the primary balance, so fiscal policy and the current account, and this is true also for the current account shock in the symmetric specification. However, when uh, we distinguish positive and negative values for this current account shock, so either improvement or, or deterioration in the terms of trade uh, for oil importers, uh, we do find uh, clear evidence of asymmetry. So we, we find that uh, uh, a shock driving to more surplus needs to, uh, uh, needs to um, uh, a tightening, um, um, no, sorry, leads to, yeah, to a tight, so basically both lead to a tightening of policy. Uh, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but basically the, the, the uh, uh, you know, the sign, so for deficits, we do find the evidence of this tightening uh, that we were observing, uh, uh, that we were kind of expecting uh, in, in the theory part. So, so only, only when we look really at the shock driving the current account and, and, and when we look at exogenous shocks, uh, in order to uh, uh, kind of sort uh, out this question of causality, then then we find some evidence uh, of uh, of asymmetry. Uh, we are still trying to understand why we should uh, find the tighter fiscal stance also for surpluses, um, and we also work in progress that we are doing right now is to try to interact the negative coefficient with country characteristics. So this counter cyclicality of fiscal policy, when faced with current account shocks. Is it due to the change reg regime, the quality of institutions? So what drive, what, what country fundamentals drive this kind of counter silica reaction of fiscal policy to current account deficits, which we seem to find in this uh, shock-based analysis. So given that I'm now short of time, I'll, I'll let, let me conclude uh, just by uh, recapping briefly what, what we, we have done and we find. So we, we basically we argued there is a rationale for asymmetric fiscal policy in reaction to uh, Current account deficit. So this is the second international problem that Keynes had already emphasized, uh, and whereby basically fiscal policy reacts more counter cyclical to, to deficits. Um, in general, there is no kind of widespread evidence of, of systematic asymmetries between surplus and deficit adjustments, uh, with, the, with the important exception that deficit adjustments are correlated with import compression and surplus adjustment with export compression. So there is overall a question that reducing these imbalances would maybe harm trade because both exports and imports would have to fall. And in, in terms of the panel regressions, we have found no clear reduced form evidence between current account positions, fiscal policy. Uh, but after these terms of trade shocks that we have identified as drivers of current account positions, we do find some evidence for, for asymmetry. And in particular, the fiscal policy is, is counter cyclical for, for deficits. So as I, as I amply emphasize, this work in progress. I, I, so I look forward to any, any reaction or, or comment. Thank you.